Healing Hands Health Society presents Dental Webinar Series. We have planned a series dental webinars to keep you abreast of current practice. This series on prosthodontics will be via Zoom, Facebook Live. Presenters are drawn from dental schools in the USA, private practitioners from around the world. To register for future webinars, visit www.hhands.org backslash dental dash training. For future inquiries, contact facilitator series uh, today we have um, two distinguished presenters um, that will be doing justice to topics that have been assigned and um, hopefully if you have questions like I said just go online and uh, go to the, the chat section and uh, drop your questions I see, I'm just gonna take a look at those who are present for right now and see if I know anybody. Um, a lot of Ethiopians um, are back on the program. Um, last week, uh, I think there, was some, there were some issues in the country. And uh, all right, so we're gonna have, um, let's see here. Dr. Adriana Sempron Clavier. I'm gonna read a bio and she's gonna take it away. She's uh, uh, Dr. Adriana Semprom Clavier is a clinical associate professor at the University of Illinois at Chicago, the Department of Restorative Dentistry at the College of Dentistry. Uh, our area of expertise is early management and treatment of dental caries, as well as teaching different technique courses in operative and uh, restorative and digital dentistry. Our research at the University of at the College of Dentistry has focused on Reimmunization and demonization of heart tissues on the high risk population for dental caries. She serves as the pre patient care co uh, director for the advanced standing DMD program. Dr. Semprom currently has the uh, our current responsibilities include curriculum development, designing, implementing, and evaluating student outcomes, amongst others. She received a DDS from Universidad Central de uh, Venezuela in 1996 and a, a USDS DDS from the University of Detroit Mercy um, in, in 2004. Uh, Dr. Semprom Clavier, thank you so much. You were my instructor back in University of, <laughs> of, of Illinois, Chicago, and I did have a wonderful, a, a really wonderful experience over there. Thank you so much for coming on this uh, webinars. Please uh, get ready, just greet our folks and, and, and take it up from here. All right, thank you, Hugo, for the invitation. I'm going to share my screen and uh, let's double check that you can see well and hear me well. Yes, all right, cool. Is that good? Yes, yes, it is. Okay. All right, so, well, it's a pleasure to. Um, to uh, be here. As Uva mentioned, um, I'm a clinical associate professor at University of Illinois at Chicago, and um, I've been here for 16 years almost, and it has been a wonderful experience. So the topic of today is a little different from what I have seen with the other webinars. Um, I like to go over, um, give you a review on what is the latest evidence with regards to non-restorative management of caries. That's my area of expertise, uh, remineralization of early carious lesions. So, you know, feel free to stop me. Um, I want to make this, you know, very interactive as possible um, presentation. And um, I brought um, some information that, you know, because of time, maybe I, you know, it could have been expanded, but I'll be happy to answer any questions um, related to any other topics on remineralization. So, uh, let me see how I can, okay. So as I said, the objective of this presentation is to provide current concepts on review uh, the process of caries diagnosis, risk assessment, and, and an overview of the currently accepted evidence-based recommendations for the management of dental caries lesions uh, with a focus on, on non-restorative management strategies. 
Um, there, there is um, need for guidelines and the ADA has put a lot of efforts on providing these guidelines for practitioners and maybe just review some of the preventive interventions for dental caries if, if time's allowed. And I, I like to also acknowledge that I don't have any commercial, I have no commercial conflicts or any interest to disclose. I do not endorse any products. If I mention products is because there are products that maybe we use here at our College of Dentistry but I do not endorse any, any product. So let's go ahead and start reviewing caries as a disease. I know it sounds like basic, but it's important to understand the basis of it in order to know how we handle it. Um, the, so this is a, a, a graphic that shows the estimated global, I'm sorry, my screen is being blocked by Zoom. Let me just move this. Um, so an estimated global prevalence of untreated dental caries in permanent teeth for 2017. Um, dental caries is the most prevalent chronic disease in the world and school aged children and adults, according to the World Health Organization. Even though it's decreasing, we do know there are specific populations that are more vulnerable uh, to caries due to socioeconomic status, due to access to care and many other issues. So. Um, Facilities like us at UIC College of Dentistry, we actually, we, we um, treat these patients that are very high risk. As you could see in the map, maybe you see your country there, that every single country has been, is, has, you know, has been touched by, by caries. So I know it's, it's, it sounds basic, but I don't want to bore you with the etiology of dental caries, but it's important to mention the basics of it. And since I know Dr. Noriove is at University of Michigan, it's important to mention the theory of uh, William Miller, who was actually the one that identified that it was a local phenomenon associated with the ingestion of carbohydrates. And, and then the ability of this acidogenic bacteria to ferment and produce organic acid that will lead to the dissolution. So this is very important. And this was the basis of the research that actually is, is allowing us to understand how to handle, how to manage caries. So go blue, yes. So we have to remember that dental caries is a complex chronic multifactorial infections, disease medi mediated by uh, endogenous biofilm that um, there are commensals of the mouth that they, um, that um, we get colonized as, you know, we are, we go through the canal at birth and it's something that we can uh, prevent. Um, you know, the, the moment we have contact with, the, with our mother, our parents and or our caregivers, there is that uh, vertical transmission that um, allows to be colonized and then form the um, the oral uh, biota. So we know that the bacteria that are in the oral flora are acidogenic and aciduric. And when there is a break of the balance in the oral environment, this bacteria take advantage over other species, disrupting the balance of the biofilm initiating the disease. So this is key here, the ecological basis of dental caries. So that the equilibrium between these um, species in the oral cavity is responsible for maintaining the health. So that's what you know, we, uh, we, we expect that they're in a symbiosis state. Now what happens is when we have ingestion of fermentable carbohydrates, I call them the arch criminals, here's where these bacteria uh, become pathogenic. They have the ability to adhere to hard surfaces. So when we have the very first tooth erupting in the mouth, um, that's a major ecolo ecological change, major maturation of the oral flora. And um, if we do not have um, the ability to really control the plaque, then there is a dysbiosis. So this diversity and the proportion of these species is going to change, disturbing the, um, the balance in the mouth, dropping the pH to the threshold below 5.5, which is we know is the, the, the threat uh, threshold for enamel, and then here's where the demeralization starts. So this is important to remember that the process of demeralization, remeralization is a dynamic process that happens every single second. As I mentioned, the key here is that the bacteria have the ability to colonize and grow, and then when we get, they get to a, um, a 
disproportionate uh, amount of colony forming units, this is where the demineralization is going to dominate over the remineralization. So here's where we expect that the management should actually start, or even before that. Of course, you know, I'm not going to talk much about the definition between primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention, but it's important to understand that when we approach this in primary prevention, it's much easier, we're more successful than when we actually deal with this um, when there is secondary prevention, when the disease has already started. So we have to really try to find our intervention um, at this point where we have no, um, there's no uh, possible visible uh, signs of changes in the structure. And I like to put this picture, this, um, you know, this is my daughter when she was six months old, not this one here, but the one that I showed the two um, erupting teeth, which, you know, as I said, this is a major ecological change in the mouth that actually allow bacteria to, or strep mutants to, to adhere to hard surfaces. And Again, I'm sure many of you have seen Dr. Key's ring that defines a multifactorial model of caries process. And uh, I think this is uh, the perfect recipe here where it puts it all together. We have to remember the host, us, or the enamel, the susceptible tissues, with its, you know, their susceptibility or even resistance as if it is exposed to fluoride. So we have a lot of different members in this webinar that um, have different, you know, set of risk factors and susceptibility depending where you grew up. If you were exposed to fluoride, you maybe have more resistance to actually um, uh, uh, counter that, that, that uh, demineralization. So that's very critical, the exposure to fluoride, your ability to, to, um, to produce saliva, the normal saliva flow. These are all critical um, aspects of protective factors from the host that can actually affect or disrupt that, uh, that symbiosis. Uh, as I already mentioned about biofilm or bacteria, we can call them carogenic bacteria. We, I'm sure you remember strep mutants, um, strep sobrinus, and streptococci um, group. But, you know, there's also even studies showing that even candida albicans could be even responsible for caries. And then the arch criminal here, the fermentable carbohydrates, sucrose, um, or any other carbohydrates that can be fermented by this bacteria um, in combination with the time. If you remember, um, if, there, if, if um, the plug is less than disturbed um, for maybe about 20 to 30 minutes, this is where the dissolution of the inorganic component of the two starts and then we start seeing changes in the in the enamel structure going from being glossy to being opaque to be matte to be uh, rough so these are these are the very early changes so you have to remember this and if there's a way that we can intervene here then uh, we can consider ourselves su successful but we cannot forget about um, some indicators all this um, um, the uh, factors that I mentioned inside the rings, these are considered consider risk factors because they are con um, directly related to the etiology of the disease. But outside of my rings, I have another big one, which is basically um, we have also socioeconomic status, behavior, that's a large, you know, in very important indicator education and even past caries experience. So all this in combination allows us to understand the process, how the caries balance or imbalance happen. This is from the John Featherstone article, basically showing the risk factors in a, in a glance, the disease indicators and the protective factors. So even though disease indicators are um, not directly related to the causality of the disease. It is important to understand them and, and when we do our questionnaire to our patient to really also uh, do a, an evaluation will allow us to see what's going on intraorally because this is going to allow us to uh, classify our patient whether it's a high risk, moderate or low. So we do know that one of the best predictors is past caries experience. So when you do your baseline information, um, even though, you, you know, this is not an exact science, we need to classify our patients at high risk at that baseline you know, moment. So the moment that we're doing an exam and we see a patient that looks like this, it is a no-brainer for everyone to show to know that this is a patient that at some point, you know, it was at high risk and at this moment there's some activity 
carries activity that we need to try to uh, arrest and, and be able to, to control. So at this point, we had a lot of, you know, demonization um, dominating over remonization where cavitation is occurring. And uh, even though I know there's already damage of the, or loss of, of the enamel structure, um, the process can be stopped at any point. Of course, here we need to restore form and we need to restore function. But with the non-restorative management, um, this can be definitely uh, controlled. Um, the key here is that the patient understand that, you know, there are factors that can be modified. Uh, and those factors are the ones that we have to focus. There are factors that are non-modifiable and they're very challenging. And so in case that the patient suffers from hyposalivation, for example, um, because they have a chronic disease and they're taking a medication, which is the most prevalent um, reason of hyposalivation, we need to provide what the patient is lacking for. I think in this picture, we show that the patient seems to have relatively good saliva flow, but this is a very typical sign of uh, dental caries in, in, in an elderly population. So we have to provide what saliva is not providing. We remember that um, even though saliva is 99% water, uh, it is very critical for the balance of our oral environment. And when we lack of the ions provided by saliva, like phosphate, calcium, fluoride, et cetera, the immunoglobins, the buffering capacity, the ability to, to remove debris, then we have to intervene and provide what saliva is not giving. So maybe, um, you know, of course, for remalization, we need to provide, you know, fluoride as our first line of treatment. Maybe a high concentration of fluoride here would be an excellent option. Um, Prevident is an example of them. Again, I'm not endorsing that brand, but it's, you know, common uh, product we use here is 5,000 ppm that can be used at home. So um, how do we provide uh, the lubrication? Uh, there are products that can be pre prescribed or even just over the counter. Uh, they are very short duration, but also help to relieve the symptoms of dryness to, to our patient. So nowadays, the way that we handle this um, disease, we have to remember that it's an infectious disease, um, is by trying to do early diagnosis. And when I talk about diagnosis, I'm not saying it's all about the objective activity of sitting, looking at lesion tooth by tooth. Um, Curious diagnosis is a process, so I'm going to go over it, the importance of understanding what needs to be included in curious diagnosis. I know it seems basic. But sometimes I think we lack of information to come up with a proper plan. And then, of course, risk assessment is part of it. Um, John Featherstone has shown us in many you know, different studies that when we classify, we do our risk assessment and we classify our patient, it makes a big difference for the purpose of management. So we um, endorse caries management by risk assessment, Canberra philosophy here at UIC, and it's something pretty standard at most of our schools here in the United States. Um, we don't treat patients all the same way. So once we identify a patient's caries risk, we tailor the treatment according to the challenges, to the factors that the patient is having, according to uh, the, uh, their, their lack of protective factors, and then we also recall this patient according to the assessment. So, for example, if we have a patient that is at high care risk, even though insurance doesn't reimburse us, we actually bring the patient after three months to reevaluate and before, you know, cavitation occurs or the, or the progression of the disease shows um, clinical signs. So the key is to target these high-risk patients. We put a lot of emphasis on, on uh, these patients that are high, identified high risk. So that's actually my area of expertise. Um, I have done some research with patients that uh, suffer from Sjogren's syndrome, which is an autoimmune disease where the salivary glands don't have the ability to produce saliva. And uh, no matter what we do, these patients are challenged every day, not only due to the demoralization that fast, that rapidly occurs, but also for all, you know, the symptoms of dryness that actually um, affect their quality of life. So this is the, you know, we have a, 
the um, a very high risk population here at UIC, and we have implemented you know measures uh, that we provide chemotherapeutic. Uh, plug control and diet management where the patients actually leave with a goodie bag here where they have at least, you know, a way to control bacteria, a way to, uh, a, a mean of remineralization, and then also um, a, a frequent recall for, for them. So as I mentioned, um, I, I like to really un um, go over the process of caries diagnosis. And again, we use this term interchangeably, caries diagnosis and caries detection, but it's not the same because caries diagnosis needs to include the patient's medical dental social history, the risk assessment, whether, where we identify risk factors and protective factors. And I know in private practice, um, not everyone has a formal form of doing risk assessment, but some way, you know, looking at at studies out there and surveys, maybe about 60 to 70 percent of dentists still, you know, do risk assessment in an informal way. Maybe we don't complete a form, but you know, um, it, it would be very critical that we understand what's a risk assessment, so then we can tailor the patient's um, care risk management plan. And as I mentioned, the moment that you see a patient that has past care risk experience, you could actually say this is one of our best predictors. So at that baseline information, you will classify your patient at high risk. If you're in doubt, rather err towards being um, over, um, the, you know, classifying our patient at high because it's not going to hurt. If we need to provide some extra resources, it's not going to hurt the patient. So the clinical examination is also critical because we need to understand, of course, the location of the carious lesion, but very importantly, um, uh, stage and activity. What I mean by stage is whether the lesion is cavitated or non-cavitated. I would add that there in my slide. And uh, carries activity, whether it is active or arrested, because that's going to determine whether we need to take um, uh, uh, to do any recommendations. So um, regarding carries lesion detection is, is one part of it. We do know that we have challenges because the traditional caries detection methods do not have the ability to really detect early caries uh, lesions and changes on the, uh, on the tissue. Um, at UIC, we do rely on the traditional uh, detection methods, uh, explorer, visual, and radiographic uh, interpretation. Uh, but we do put a lot of emphasis on, um, on making sure that uh, we dry the surface, we eliminate the plaque because we know that nowadays when we do our patients, um, non-cavitated lesions are more prevalent than cavitated lesions. Um, so when I say uh, non-cavitated lesions is that early stage where there is no enamel breakdown, and I'll show some pictures in a little bit. Uh, there are changes on the structure where you see the loss of glossiness, the loss of smoothness to roughness, and so that's where you can really start um, uh, charting even. They need to be charted. Of course, we do know that GB Black doesn't classify this type of lesion, so we do not use GB Black classification anymore. Uh, we're gonna go over the ADA CARES classification that actually includes this type of lesions. Um, so as I mentioned, in, as part of our CARES diagnosis, once we've done our patient questionnaire and understanding the social factors and, um, and the uh, risk assessment. We do a very thorough clinical examination, but as I said, I have it in red here because teeth should be dry and plaque must be removed in order to be able to visualize the changes on the structure. Um, we do use of the Explorer. I'm sure you, many of you have read um, the research about the explorer having uh, potential problems associated with its use on possible cavitation when we have an early um, lesion, inoculation of bacteria, or even just poor sensitivity. So the fact that we have a catch, we discourage this word here, it's, it's like a sin when they say, I got a catch, Dr. Semprum. Um, it uh, doesn't mean anything to us, right? So we do know that using an explorer does, does not in, um, increase the accuracy of our caries detection process. We do use it, we just use it judiciously. We use it to remove the plaque, to get a feel of the surface, but we do not probe or poke hard. 
And, you know, yeah, we do understand occlusal surfaces are pretty challenging. Um, so when I tell them when they look at an occlusal surface, staining alone, it doesn't mean there is a, it can't be interpreted as a caries lesion. Um, if there's a stain pit or fissure, maybe that's a, a, at some point there was something that started there, but um, that it maybe it's an arrested process, so it's a very common sign on an adult tooth. But the picture you see here, these are obvious signs of demineralization where you see just yes, discoloration, but it's surrounded by a halo that where we can see actually that the enamel is undermined. And then when you, you see on this picture, then there would definitely progression of the curious lesion to the dentine. Um, so then this one, of course, needed operative intervention. And you know, this is what I meant by, there's a lot of different anatomical challenges with occlusal, so we discouraged, you know, the poking or use of the exploder here, but having a stain pit, um, you know, doesn't mean that it actually needs to be restored or needs to be operatively treated. Um, so I think it's, you know, I, I tell the students, you have to make sure that you find other signs uh, around the, the, the area. So visual detection is very important. We do emphasize the use of, you know, of, as I said, just sharp eyes and we call it blunt explorer. Um, what is the challenge that we encounter with the caries detection? When we do a, a, an examination to our patient as a, for the first time, you're getting to know your patient. Yes, you can detect changes on the structure, but one of the, the keys here is that we need to identify the caries activity. You know, with we can't really, uh, make conclusions with a single test uh, for uh, our patient's care risk and our patient diagnosis. We have to rely on multiple tests, as you know, it's a complex disease. So yes, um, we don't do microbiological tests, but we look at the accumulation of plaque, we do a diet assessment, uh, we don't evaluate, you know, the pH of saliva, but something that if you like to do for patient education is easily done. Uh, we don't also do uh, any buffering capacity, but these are tests that, you know, could help you just identify curious activity. Um, but the key here is the longitudinal assessment of these patients, okay? So let's look at that. So if you look at, you know, a, a lesion, or a tooth that looks with these characteristics, these are the typical sign of you know, healthy enamel, bathed by saliva, glossy, um, smooth maybe to the, to the exploration, uh, and um, with areas of you know, discoloration that's commonly found. Obviously, when you see something like this, this is magnified, um, but when you do the examination, maybe, yes, you might, you, know, you don't have to probe in that area to know there is a break of the enamel, um, the key, the key here is, you know, of course, you have to complete your examination uh, with radiographic interpretation. Uh, as you know, you can't use just one test alone, but this is an obvious sign of a tooth that has gone through a lot of demineralization or remineralization, and at the point is showing signs of inactive of activity. I'm sorry, where we see dull, chalky white, you know, surfaces. So this is obvious that needs to be uh, treated operatively. But what can we do clinically to really understand what is the caries activity? And as I mentioned, the ultimate way for us to know is to follow these patients over time. So we can't come out with a conclusion. We can just do, we can do a temporary um, diagnosis. But the key here is when you bring your patient back is to um, do this reassessment, this risk assessment and reevaluation to be able to, to conclude in why, where is the progression, if there's progression. So how do we measure activity? There are some descriptors here. We use our clinical cues. And on the left side, you have, um, you know, if you have a lesion that presents with white, chalky, rough, dull, matte, or loss of luster, maybe that's likely to be active. Uh, if you see, as I mentioned, a shadow halo under the pin and fissures, you have lots of risk factor dominating over protective factor. You see a cervical um, lesion that is covered by plaque, thick plaque that has been left undisturbed with gingival inflammation around it and bleeding or probing. Then you can interpret that that lesion is most likely going toward demineralization. So you need to really intervene. But as I said, monitoring over time is very critical. Um, 
If you see, could be dark, could be, could be brown, but if it's shiny, translucent, smooth, hard to the touch with no biofilm and no inflammation around it, maybe you can interpret it as an arrested inactive lesion. So we have to be careful uh, on not over treating this type of lesions if you can identify these signs of arrested or inactive lesions. And of course, understanding the patient's behavior with its protective factors, then that would help you also understand to what direction these lesions are going. So this is, these are pictures taken from NEVAD, one of the studies just showing clinical manifestation of active or inactive lesions. So when you see something like this, we call it active non cavitated This is the terminology we're using. We don't use, we try to support the use of three terminology as, you know, class five, class one, but we want to know more than that. Um, so this is active because you see gingival inflammation, dull, white, chalky appearance. Um, on the bottom, you see a, another sign of uh, inactive, also non-cavitated lesion. This can be also called white spot lesions. Um, here also non-cavitated, maybe micro-cavitation, which is only um, on the enamel surface. And, and then this is obvious more, you know, progression of cavitated lesions that they need to be treated. So here is, is a, these are challenging surfaces that are covered by plaque. They need to be removed. So this is obvious. You could see there's um, chalky and, and dull looking. So that looks like there's some active. Um, and then if you compare it with the one in the bottom, you could see that there is staining. So we discourage actually the, um, you know, planning something for this type of lesion. Um, as it shows, there's not cavitation. And, and most likely it's inactive. Um, even something like this where you see microcavitation, when I mean my, by microcavitation, I mean that the cavitation is only at enamel, on the enamel, not progressing to, you know, the dentin, so maybe hasn't crossed the DJ, and even something like this can be handled in a very conservative way by placing a sealant and denying the sources of, of nutrition to that bacteria, and so if the technique is done correctly, then there's plenty of evidence and overwhelming evidence showing that sealants can even just be used as a secondary prevention measure. So what I mean as secondary prevention measure means that the, there's an early stage of caries already, of a carious lesion that has already started, okay? And then we have, of course, this is obvious that needs to be restored and it's an advanced lesion. So I wanted to share with the group, um, I don't know what part of the world you are, but uh, I think this is something that I'm sure many of you have seen. The American Dental Association um, in 2015 published this CARES classification system. There was a group of um, experts and uh, stakeholders that got together to be able to come up with a simple way of classifying caries, but, but that would also include these early stages of non-cavitated lesions that are not included in any other classification. Uh, we actually use ICDAS. ICDAS is the um, International Caries Detection Assessment System that um, has been used and validated for research purposes and where, you know, if you want to validate, for example, a, a technology, then we use ICDAS to, to um, validate that technology. So um, it classified from sound from a, you know, not existing, no clinical detectable lesion to an initial, initial lesion where it's the earliest clinical detectable lesion that could be just compatible with from having just some mild demoralization to even when you see uh, radiographically a lesion that has reached the DEJ and that maybe has reached into that um, inner half of the dentin. So I know this one has a wide range and I think we're gonna focus today on this, um, this type of lesion. Uh, when we then review moderate or advanced, it's more um, clear to us that these are, you know, it has visible signs of enamel breakdown where the uh, dentin is actually exposed and there is cavitation, it could be shallow, but even there's microcavitation that maybe needs to be handled by a, 
uh, early uh, restoration by restoration. And then of course here on the advanced, um, this one classifies as very you know, advanced process with fully cavitated lesions and where obviously uh, we have dentin exposure that, that actually needs to be treated, okay? So where's the question comes over here I don't know if you can see my circle, but I'm sure here's where, you know, many of the practitioners show disagreement on handling this type of lesions. And the question here is, do we try to remineralize? Do we restore it? Uh, how can we handle this? And I ask my students, what is the answer here? Do we treat everyone the same? I can have two patients presenting with this type of lesion, but I'm not going to treat these patients all you know the same way what do we need to know going back to the process of caries diagnosis we need to understand what the patient's challenges the risk assessment and that's going to help you determine what is the best management if you have a patient that presents with low risk a patient that has normal saliva flow relatively good diet um good plaque control and this is the very first lesion um I will attempt remineralization, and there's plenty of evidence that shows that a lesion that has reached the DPA um, and even just passed to the early to the inner outer half. I'm sorry, outer half of the dentin can actually have successful remineralization if cavitation has not occurred. Of course, the question in here is how do we know if cavitation has occurred? So there's more research showing that when we look at this type of lesions. 40% of those lesions have not cavitated yet. So there's a chance for remineralization in here. And uh, so the way that we're going to handle is by, by knowing our patient's risk factors. Okay, so if our patient is high care risk, maybe we will need to intervene and be more aggressive. But if this is a low to moderate, most likely I'm going to attempt remineralization to these type of lesions. Okay, so yes, um, let's go ahead and look at this patient. It's a calibration exercise for everyone here. I know we have a diverse group of, of um, attendees here. So we have a 37-year-old uh, Caucasian male that has you know, normal uh, BP and pulse, actually low. This is a, this is a runner, uh, blood glucose of 90, uh, and uh, does present with stomach ulcer with no current medication. Uh, the patient uses a fluoridated toothpaste twice a day, visits the dentist once a year. Um, it's a student, BC student that lives in a, in a BC area here in Chicago. As I said, it's a marathon uh, runner and uh, does, not, does not use any recreational drugs. Uh, when we did the risk assessment, you know, uh, we identified presence of non-cavitated lesions. Um, they need to be charted. Uh, uh, past caries history, so there was restorations that were placed within the three years. It's relatively healthy, vegetables and fruit, but also there's frequent sugar intake, drinks coffee, so nothing out of the ordinary takes is uh, sport drinks that actually are pretty acidic and high in sugar, like Gatorade, and, but they ha he has normal saliva flow. So what would be the patient's caries risk here? Think about it. Of course, this is high. As I mentioned, if you have past caries history right away, this patient needs to be um, placed under high risk, okay? So we look at some pictures, not a lot of dentistry done, relatively, as I said, healthy, some uh, restorations done, but very small restorations. And, you know, looking at x-rays, you see that uh, if we look, go by the ADA caries classification, this would be classified as initial caries lesions, we could see uh, lesions that are in the inner, maybe inner half of the enamel. Um, you could see, you know, the typical pattern of the demoralization here. So for sure, when I see this type of lesions, this patient needs to be placed at a um, high concentration regimen of fluoride, as I mentioned, maybe Prevident 5000 or any, you know, any um, high concentration toothpaste that could actually help that can be done at home. Uh, fluoride varnish. So this is, this is a good example of a patient, you know, common patient you're gonna have in your practice. And uh, going over the risk factors and what can the patient modify to be able to um, 
to control this type of lesions. We, um, I, I like to say that here at UIC, we do not treat this type of lesions with operative intervention. Of course, there's always a lot of variabilities. I can't you know, deny that, but this is what we teach here. Um, so sometimes I have students that come and show me just a, a bi wing along and I say, uh, is this enough for us to make a decision? What else do we need to know? What um, is gonna help you make a decision? How are you gonna handle this? So obviously going back to risk assessment, to knowing the patient's medical history and the behavioral aspect for us to be able to understand how we're gonna treat this type of lesions. So if this is a patient that, you know, is relatively low risk uh, because um, you know these are relatively new lesions then we can try to attempt remineralization. So I just like to share a this is a radiographic interpretation of carriage progression and this is was based on a study that actually showed um, it, uh, did a survey to 500 practitioners and asking them to what you know stage would actually they would consider operative intervention. And they, um, they, uh, the, the survey was done to females and male, they control for the gender, for the years of experience, for their um, CE courses, for the type of practice. And so what um, these practitioners actually showed is that about 10% of these practitioners would actually restore in the uh, uh, on the uh, confined on uh, on lesions that are confined to enamel, actually about I would say seventeen percent, and then more like eighty two percent actually would wait until um, this lesion would be at least to the other third of the dentin. What actually influenced our decision? And interesting enough, it was their years of experience. Um, so those that actually had only about one to five years of experience, they used the DEJ at their tipping point. Um, those that actually had 20 or plus years of experience, they were actually, they were restoring very early on on the enamel. And those that had about plus 10 years of experience, actually they would wait until the lesion would get until to dentin. So, you know, what I'm trying to illustrate here, there's a lot of variability, even though there are guidelines that are put in place, this is very common to do, to, to have in, in private practice. So we just have to stay updated. Another variability here was actually their C courses. Those that had, you know, experiences with early C courses were a little bit more on the conservative side. So this is a very common finding. I think in any place in the world that we're going to see this um, variability on how we handle these type of lesions. And, um, and even though we have guidelines, um, it, it, it is, um, you know, we're still not, we don't have a threshold that say exactly where we, how we handle this. So um, I like to share this because I emphasize so much on longitudinal assessment. This is actually a series of bio-wings that was um, taken in one of our, our my colleague's husband, uh, one of our faculty here. Um, the husband came on June, 2014 and um, you could see there were early signs of um, enamel. We could call them E1, E2 type of lesions. So we, we use um, that terminology. So you can maybe see in tooth number three, mesial, tooth number four, mesial and distal. Um, also, you would see here uh, on 14, 13. So you would see here um, the typical progression of carious lesion. And at this moment, when we did the assessment, of course, he was considered high risk. Um, he's just, you know, typical, um, relatively healthy diet, very similar to the patient that actually I showed you. And um, we put him under a regimen of um, a Prevident 5000 with, you know, going over hygiene, how to control plaque, um, chlorhexidine for a couple of weeks and then we follow him two years later and then if you compare the size of the lesions uh, after two years um, the lesions have not changed significantly they are still there but they have not progressed so this is just showing how longitudinal assessment can 
can assist you to see uh, the progression of these lesions. And then we have also uh, pictures from 2017. We will have to bring him back. It's been three years. We haven't seen him. And um, uh, you could see that the lesions actually have maintained pretty much about the same uh, you know, size. So I would consider this success because you know, over this period of three years, the patient um, uh, you know, has been able to actually control these lesions. He's, you know, comes once a, once a year only. So this, I would I'd definitely like to see this patient more often, but because maybe it's the husband of one of our colleagues and, uh, you know, hopefully we have a little more control, but this is just an excellent example to show uh, caries activity. Um, so here you could see all the several, you know, lesions that, are either on the outer half or the inner half of the enamel. So there's a lot of challenges we have. And so occlusal caries, as I mentioned, the fact that we have an exploder sticking to a pit doesn't mean much. We have to really pay a lot of attention to these changes that we see undermining the enamel, the halo, the opacities. And these are obvious lesions that I already showed you. Uh, in our ADA cares classifications, these are called microcavitation. I would call them maybe a moderate, um, moderate size, okay? So I showed this before. Um, so studies have shown that those lesions uh, on, the, on occlusal surfaces that are located at the DJ you know, have, are very are rarely cavitated. So this is for you guys to think about it, how you can handle it in a very conservative way. So let's go ahead and talk about uh, risk assessment uh, management quickly. Um, so we know already what we need to include. Again, I'm just going to skip this quickly. Um, these are, you know, evidence on decision making showing that um, the, you know, cavitation rates of inner enamel vary a lot, but still, you know, it's relatively um, conservative from 11 to 60 percent and the and then in outer dentin about 65 to 100 percent so um, you know we don't have enough evidence to conclude what is the clinical threshold of the restoration of, of which uh, the restoration of proximal caries is recommended but I want to focus you know the remaining minutes that we have on this um, chart this is a publication from J from JADA in 2018 that actually is providing guidance on non restorative management uh, of of non cavitated and cavitated lesion what i like about this and they have this chart for adults for permanent teeth and also for primary teeth i'm going to focus on permanent teeth here but it divides on coronal and root caries and also on the location and then on whether it's non-cavitated and, and cavitated, so you could see as first line of treatment for occlusal non-cavitated um, sealants or either fluoride varnish. And then for cavitated lesion, silver diamine fluoride, um, I'm gonna just briefly touch over that. And so you could see for, and this is again, just to remind you, this is a non-restorative management. We know that silver diamine fluoride is an alternative to a, a restoration, especially at this time where COVID, um, you know, it's actually affecting the way we practice. We want to try to reduce the aerosols. This is a perfect opportunity to be able to use this type of therapies rather than nothing. So you could see that it's actually the same for facial interproximal 38, you know, percent of silver diamine uh, fluoride. Um, for non-cavitated lesions and interproximally, the evidence shows strong on the use of fluoride varnish. Uh, resin infiltration is like a second line of treatment. We don't do that at UIC, but it's um, another option. Um, and then for facial or lingual, fluoride varnish definitely is a, an excellent option. For root caries, whether it's non-cavitated or cavitated, um, 5,000 ppm of sodium fluoride, like for example, the one I have here, Prevident, um, is a very good option for, for and first line of treatment for root caries management, and also fluoride varnish, um, and possibly SDF. So here you have all different delivery systems, and this is to show the different concentrations, whether it's um, apply at home, or professionally applied. So you could see that fluoride varnish is about 22 ppm, 1000 ppm. And then silver diamine is actually the highest concentration you're going to find, which is 44,000 uh, ppm, which I know it's already used in many countries. So 
Uh, fluoride varnish, we use it very often. We know it enhances the uptake of minerals, uh, has some bacterial activity. Um, applied twice a year for those patients that are at high risk is an excellent option, especially for those elderly patients. And um, it's a very easy way of, of, you know, of controlling caries. Um, quickly, I want to go over sealants too. As I mentioned, um, sealing infected dentin definitely changes the environment. So using this as a secondary preventive measure is something that could definitely be done. It will arrest humanization if it's done well. As I said, it will deny the nutrition to the bacteria changing the oral environment under the sealant. And if it's done well, it can be retained over time and actually you know, um, do a good prevention. Um, so as I said here, placement of pitting fissure sealants significantly reduces the percentage of non-cavitated caries lesions that progress in children, adolescents, and adults for as long as five years over sealant placement compared with unsealed teeth. Um, I'm just gonna quickly show this graphic, which shows the percentage reduction in mean bacteria count, um, the goals, and these are, maybe you can read this, but these are months since the sealant was placed. So you could see how it goes from 50, to 90% of mean bacteria reduction. So it's showing overwhelming. There's a lot of evidence that shows that uh, sealants are effective even in non-cavitated stages of the lesion uh, in all, you know, all types of patients. Um, silver diamine, I'm sure it's a hot topic now. Um, it's a you know, clear, very easy, complex fluoride that can be indicated. Um, in cases that are hard to treat, for multiple lesions, patients are medically compromised and are waiting to be treated in the OR. Um, in areas that can be difficult to treat, like frication, interproximal areas, extreme carriage risk, patients that have limited access to care would surface, um, and it's very easy to apply. However, there needs to be an informed consent because it stains pretty, pretty easily. Um, so it can actually even have a chemical burn on the skin if it's not done um, with careful uh, management of it. But it's something that can be easily done. And with one drop, you can actually get to treat multiple lesions. Um, and there's a lot of evidence showing that, you know, um, clinical trials have shown that uh, of 80% more effective in stopping uh, or arresting caries than even sodium fluoride. So the, the, the silver is the antibacterial, the fluoride is pretty much the, the remineralization agent. In the US was clear in 2015 as a anti-hypersensitivity agent, so we use it off-label, um, but it actually worked for caries arrest, it's safe and it's um, effective and very biocompatible. So this is an example of a patient, a 60 year old came to our practice here that hasn't seen a dentist in 30 years and wanted to manage all these caries lesions where you know, silver diamine was an excellent option for this patient, be able to arrest the lesions and of course then determine restorability and management of this, of this case. Um, I know I'm going over time. Just quickly, I want to also touch that um, ADA, um, you know, we also use calcium-based products, even though the expert panel um, did not support, you know, the use of it as a first line of treatment. It's just recommended as an adjunct therapy, but it is actually an excellent option for those high-risk high patients. Um, we don't have enough in vivo studies to support its effectiveness, but it's, an, it's an, a really good um, you know, way to maintain the state of supersaturation of calcium in the mouth um, and try to enhance remineralization, even for those patients that actually deny the use of fluoride. It shouldn't be used as a substitute, but it should be used more as an adjunct. So to, to finish here, I'd like to show you the array of caries management of, uh, for occlusal caries going in you know, at the stage of being reversible from, you know, as I said, preventive measures that focus on risk assessment, antibacterial, fluoride, diet modification, very critical, oral hygiene, um, preventive measures like pits and fissure sealants, PRR, repair versus replacement, uh, and of course, composites and glass ionomers to amalgam. So you could see all the different stages here. Um, for interproximal, 
um, you know, fluoride varnish, we actually use quite a lot. We're in the process and assessing resin infiltration to see it could be an option for even our adult clinic. <clears throat> As I said, um, repair versus uh, replacement and then composite and of course amalgam. So very important, you know, all these efforts must be focused on reducing the sugar consumption, of course, enhancing remineralization, supplementing with fluoride and many other strategies. But even if we do all these chemical and biological therapies, um, there's not much that we can do if the patient doesn't understand there's a lot of um, behavioral modifications that need to be done to reduce the exposure to these etiological factors. Um, I'm gonna take two more minutes to um, just share with you, since I'm the director of the Advanced Standing and Dental Degree Program, um, Uvo asked me to share um, a little bit about our program, what we do. Uh, this is a program that is 27 semesters long, so it's two and a half years. Um, it starts in January in, uh, in Chicago, um, where our temperature is actually, um, you know, very frigid. Um, so we have 52 students that actually enroll in January, and it's uh, seven semesters where two preclinical sem pre semesters are Focus on uh, just uh, calibrating our advanced standing students to be able to prepare and enter clinics for five clinical semesters. Um, so it is actually very advantageous because we focus on the needs for the for the advanced standing students, and then they integrate with their D threes and D fours in clinic. It's a hybrid curriculum, um, case based learning, a small group setting. Uh, we do call, we don't try to not have lectures. We call them interactive didactic sessions because that's what we expect. Team-based learning. And then we do have preclinical sessions where we do a lot of partnering activities uh, in order to actually do our first um, exercises on each other. Clinical sessions and then rotations. So this is uh, Chicago in January. I don't like to scare anyone, but you know, it's, it's beautiful, but it's frigid. And these are just pictures of our uh, one of our groups, 52 students, and here with faculty too. Um, we use uh, this clinic that has you know nice AV, so then we have the ability also to to present and then work. And you know, uh, as I mentioned, I'm a runner. These are pictures that I take when I run, and uh, I like to show that in Chicago we have beautiful sunrises. Like this morning, we had one gorgeous sunrise, and actually. Um, is a, a, a you know a good reason to be here too. So I'd like to conclude to the group that you know we have to always think about Canberra as our philosophy, and always remember that in order for you to make a decision to restore, you need to really emphasize risk assessment, caries activity, and extent of the lesion. Um, this is one of my favorite slides to finish. This is by Nigel Pitts, where we see. The tip of the iceberg is the clinical detectable lesion where actually we do preventive care and operative intervention, but we really need to understand all this, uh, what's going on underneath before actually this manifests. Um, having said that, this is Sleeping Bear Dunes, Michigan, Upper Michigan. I know Uvo is um, up in Michigan, so this is a gorgeous area to visit if you're in Michigan. This is my son climbing one of those dunes that are quite steep. So I hope this type of practice doesn't become um, a steep slope like this one, as we understand that there are challenges with reimbursement, but actually I think it's the best you know, benefit here for our patients. So I'm going to open this for uh, questions and uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions related to the presentation. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you so much, Dr. Semprom, for that uh, very detailed presentation. Uh, if you have any questions, Dr. Fiemo, I know your hands are up. Do you want to ask a question? Should I stop sharing my screen or should I continue yes, yes, sharing? Yes. You, can, you can stop, no problem. Um, doctor, if you have any question, yes, I can see. Oh, okay, you don't have a question. Um, any questions out there? If you have any questions, you can type it out uh, on the chat in the, Q in the Q and A section. Um, you're just going to hang on for a few minutes. Um, 
And I apologize for the rush at the end. Um, there's a lot more that I, you know, I could have gone over silver diamine or even arginine, which is another therapy that it's actually coming, coming more, uh, uh, there's showing promising research. So I'll be happy even, um, I'm gonna put my email up again. Um, if anyone, just feel free to just email me. Uh, okay. Dr. Omesi. That's, okay. That's okay. You can leave it. You can leave it. You know, feel free to share my email. Okay. Right. Yeah, I'll, I'll put it there. I'll put it there. Dr. Omesi, are you there? Dr. Dona? Good afternoon. I, I always uh, like calling on you. <laughs> I know you are in the restorative dentistry. Um, what, what is your experience with? Um, do, do you use silver diamine fluoride in your in your hospital? And uh, not too much of that. Um, okay. Not too much of that. Is it readily um, available? Um, not uh, as much as we would want it to be, really. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. Th thank you. I just wanted to find out. You know, if, if anybody from Ethiopia? If you use, um, what, what is your experience? I want to call on somebody from Ethiopia. If you are there, um, Tamrat Aaron, I'm going to call on you, Tamrat Aaron. Yeah, I know you are from Ethiopia. You are able to talk. If you want to, if you have um, any experience to share in early childhood care. So, what do you use? What do you use typically um, in your clinics in in, in Ethiopia? Dr. Tamra, can you hear me? Uh, Dr. Aaron Ose, you are from Ghana. Do you have any experience with that? He's muted. Okay. Okay. So, hello? Yeah, go ahead, Dr. Aaron. Yeah, so for us now, because of the COVID, we, we usually do um, glass ionoma. Okay. So we do ARTs and then for the cavities after doing the ART we restore with glass ionoma or sometimes ZOE. I see. So 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 the use of uh um you, you guys have not started using uh zinc um uh, silver diamine fluoride in your clinics. Not readily available as yet. I see. Wait, what what hospital do you work? Are you in Kolebu? Yes, please. Okay. Anyway, uh if if anyone any other play, any other country, is anyone from Saudi Arabia? Uh, or someone from um, Uganda, if you have anything, you can send us, send us a mail uh, and uh, we will talk about it. Uh, well, thank you guys for all this um, chipping in. Uh, Dr. Uh, I'll say I will get in touch with you so that we can talk more on what we can do in Ghana. Thank you so much, Dr. Dr. Sam from Clavier, for that excellent presentation. It has been um, an honor to, you know, very good, you know, Nice to have you this um, Saturday morning. Thank you for, for, you know, I know it's bright, it's still early in Chicago. Uh, you're welcome. Actually, there's a question about uh, if it's if nano hydroxyapatite is effective as silver diamine fluoride. I do not have any information about nano hydroxyapatite. Um, I can tell you in any of the countries that you are, especially with this challenging time, um, it's an excellent, inexpensive, easy way to arrest the lesion. And I just want to share that one, just one last thing. As you mentioned that you apply uh, glass ionomer, uh, uh, the, the, um, there is a technique now that there's not a lot of evidence out here, but uh, we use is something called the SMART technique. Basically, you apply silver diamine and then you place a conventional glass ionomer on top um, to be able to, to restore and seal the margins. Of course, we know ideally the uh, sealing uh, the margins is the, is the goal, but in those cases that we can't use aerosol, um, applying silver diamine, and that could be done two ways. You can leave it for two weeks and then come back and apply the glass ionomer and that would actually, in two weeks, you can, sign, you can observe the signs of the arresting of the lesion. Or even you could, it's not as ideal, but you could also apply the silver diamine, dry it, and then place a conventional glass ionomer on top. 
Um, so I think that's a wonderful alternative to have in mind our armamentarium, especially at this time. And even here in the U.S., where the resources are, are, are you know, are amazing. Um, this is actually a wonderful therapy to have in mind for those patients that have um, high care, care risk risk. Um, so this can be a whole presentation by itself. So sorry, yeah. I'm taking over the no time. Problem. Over. One last question here. Is there any place for the use of dyes in the detection of caries? Where we do what? I'm sorry? Caries detection dyes. Very good question. Very good question. So the research about caries dyes, uh, detection dyes, um, show that it can be used for a new learner. However, we discourage the use of it here in, in a UIC because it can give you lots of false positives. So it stains everything. So it can actually, you know, lead you to over reduce or over treat. So um, we do not use any caries dyes uh, lately here at UIC. So that's actually, um, yeah, is our philosophy here at UIC. Uh, there is a question about there's billable CDT code for SDF. Yes, the code for SDF is, let me, if I remember right, is 13, um, I can just, uh, it's actually in my presentation, 1354. And uh, there's two ways of coding this, it, um, it, as you know, uh, silver diamine fluoride solution, 1354, and then there is a, another code, which is, I think is called carries arrest. I can't recall from the top of my head, but there are two ways of coding uh, silver diamine. Okay. So it is absolutely a billable CDT code okay. uh, here in the United States. It's a great question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Semprom. I'm sure we're going to have you back uh, at another time. We're going to have uh, another, you know, block of lectures uh, planned for later in the year. But uh, it's been wonderful having you. And uh, thank you so much. And we really appreciate your presence here today. It's a pleasure. Take care. Um, thank you so much. Healing Hands Health Society presents Dental Webinar Series. We have planned a series of dental webinars to keep you abreast of current practice. This series on prosthodontics will be via Zoom, Facebook Live. Presenters are drawn from dental schools in the USA, private practitioners from around the world. To register for future webinars, visit www.hhands.org backslash dental training. For future inquiries, contact facilitator 